Aloha, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're just going to wait a few moments just to let people, you know, flow through in the opening minutes. Just want to say welcome. Have an exciting artist talk tonight. An amazing guest moderator. So we're just gonna, just a few more moments and we'll get started. All right. Okay, I think we should just jump into it. We have a lot to get through. Uh, so aloha, thank you so much for, for tuning in. Uh, this is our uh, one, of, one of our remaining artist talks for the Artists of Hawaii Now exhibition, which is currently on view uh, until January 16th. We're, so we're in the closing weeks and we encourage everybody to check out the exhibition if you haven't already. Uh, we've been having these series of artist talks uh, over the course of the exhibition, bringing together different artists to um, have kind of a cross dialogue about the different issues and different practices that they've been exploring in their work. And today we have Na'alahu Anthony, Jennifer Goya, and Kapulani Landgraf, um, moderated by Mahina Peshan Duarte of Bye Bye Collective. And uh, I'm going to um, pass the torch to Mahina in a bit. But before before I do, um, you know, um, I just want to sort of sh share a little bit about the intentions behind these artist talks. Um, you know, it was really to kind of create the safe space for um, really onyx exchange of dialogue about each artist's work and um, you know the tough issues that every artist and every every piece is grappling with. And um, to kind of create this sort of like cross-sectional space uh, between the different artists and creatives, um, and you know we have we've been having guest moderators throughout uh, throughout the, the the series, and so we're very honored to have Mahina with us today uh, to moderate and guide us through today's conversation. Uh, Mahina Peshan Duarte is a Hawaiian Mahine social entrepreneur that owns and operates three Hawaii based businesses, including Bye Bye Collective. And when COVID 19 struck, she co founded Aina Aloha Economic Futures with a small group of volunteers to bring to life a resilient economy through core values of Aloha Aina, a deep and abiding love for Hawaii's communities and natural environments. Mahina and her ohana live on their small family farm and ranch on the slopes of North Kona, Hawaii. And you can find Mahina surfing, working at Heia Fish Pond, sailing on Makali'i, or exploring Hawaii's native forest where she is happiest. And couldn't be more proud and honored to be able to welcome her to this space. And thank you so much, Mahina, for bringing your voice and your and and your mana and just like your spirit to this conversation. It, it means the world. Um, so I'm going to pass it on to Mahina, and and uh, we'll take it from there. Yeah, mahalo ya oi e Taylor me na limahana mahoma ya oko na hua kuka na hua makamaka kuka ko poe o Hawaii aloha nui kako no laila mamua ka ka vehe ana i ke ya kuka kami ilio. E kono paha uh, mako i na kupuna amena akua e noho pumai e noho pumai e noho pumai e kane amelo no na kua mahi ai ho olai ka aina apo ho ka aia unu kupu kupu a ulu lau po o ole a o kanui i a o ka ai aue ka ne a melo no a mama uanoa as we're transitioning out of uh, one season to the next, from a time of makahiki to a time of ku, 
Um, and then all of this, um, you know, this chatter uh, around around our remembrance that water water is is so vitally important to all of us. And so I just wanted to um, take 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 time to um, uh, acknowledge the various Akua and um, Omoku and Kupuna and our contemporary mentors and leaders that are that are that are always with us and always guiding us okay so i think i put into um uh into text or into chat for everyone so hopefully those who are listening in um via zoom if you would just you know indulge us here's an opening question because and, and this is pertinent to our first uh panelist yeah where were you when Hokulea first left for Tahiti? Where were you? Where were you? So go ahead and just, you know, those who are listening in, who are chiming in, whether it's by via, via Facebook or Zoom, yeah, go ahead and please um, mention where were you um, when Hokulea first left for Tahiti? Awesome, you guys. Um, just a little bit about, about my style of moderation, for, uh, if, if, if I've been able to, um, if you've joined me uh, in any of the conversations that I've had the, the honor and privilege of, of helping to, to curate or to host, um, I think you'll know that I, I like to keep it pretty organic and pretty loose, so um, please, and I love it when we all get to make this truly a dialogue and to, you know, to share your perspective and your voice in all the ways that are, are available to us via chat, um, via, um, you know, Facebook, um, and all of those, those ways. Okay, first up, the first person that we're going to bring on to the, to, the, to the virtual stage is a dear friend of mine. I actually first met this guy uh, in middle school at the School on the Hill at Kapalama. And one of the first things that I remember of Na'alehu Anthony is that he was always, always in the hustle, always an entrepreneur, always creating and innovating. Probably gonna get, you know, anyways. The first time I, I, I like really had a conversation with him, we we're in middle school and he was trying to sell um, candy. He like brought in this, this uh, you know, this item that was not contraband on, on campus. And he was trying to sell candy just to make a couple more dollars. Cause you know, Gotta, you gotta just try and 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 put on the hustle whenever we can. Lahu, I thought I'd just throw in a little bit of a, a roast because you know your your uh, accolades are so um, are so many, yeah. But just to get it, it, <laughs> we gotta keep it real over here. But if you didn't know, he is a tremendously talented, gifted, visionary that I truly, truly am so um, blessed to know. Um, he's the founder of Poliku Documentary Films, the production company that focuses on documentaries and oral histories with a special em emphasis on Hawaii and its people. He has a vast array of experience in the film industry and has been immersed in the Hawaiian community throughout his life. His desire to give a voice to Hawaii stories as told by Hawaiians from our perspective is the very, very reason that Na'alehu has pursued a career in film and television. His uh, great passion is being a part of the voyaging community. And that's actually um, the second chapter of our friendship. And as a crew member since 19, 1996, and more recently as a captain aboard Hokulea, his voyaging experiences have shaped and defined him as a person and has been a focal point for his films. He was in charge of onboard communications for the team that documented the worldwide voyage and sailed multiple legs of the journey. And so, you know, just on a, on a personal note, um, some of the things that I really appreciate about you, Lahu, is this, is that because you have this privilege of being, you know, having traveled the world, whether it be by canoe, um, by foot, um, in altering vehicles, whatever. And you've had the opportunity to meet and engage with like some really interesting people and some of the world's leaders, right? I believe you got to meet um, Desmond Tutu as well and many others, yeah. you know, spiritual leaders. 
um, scholars, peace, peace brokers. Um, and so Lehue, I mean, I, I, I see this in you. I, I see you applying these uh, experiences that perhaps um, you've been able to, to harvest and gather um, from, from the many mentors uh, that you've had in your life. And I see you applying it now. And I see you doing some, some really um, catalytic work in, in really quiet and humble ways. And I just want to tell you, I appreciate you for that, my friend. Thank you, Maina. OK, so let's, let's see a little bit of a piece of, of his work. The canoe is actually a great metaphor for a, a lot of things. Uh, certainly one of unity and, and working towards uh, a final destination that all of this good work by crew members can get us to. But it's also, I think, a reflection for the health of ourselves and our community in a, in a lot of ways. One of the things that's so important for us as a community as we seek a new destination for Hawaii is to look at some of the values that come from the canoe. You know, the, there's the Olalo no Eau that speaks to this idea that uh, the canoe is an island and our island is a canoe. He moku he va'a, he va'a, he moku. And what that does is that reminds us as well to be good stewards of the resources that we do have. We can be a symbol for uh, overuse. We can also be a symbol for hope. And I hope that that's one of the things that comes across as we interact with folks about uh, voyaging and voyaging canoes. I'm grateful for the opportunity to understand that there is an expansion and recognition of what art is. And that's something that's constantly evolving. It's so important to the dynamic fabric of this place that we can bring in the kinds of projects that interest us to help to elevate the work and to do it in a way that welcomed us. It's, I think that's really important to whatever comes next. Yeah, mahalo. You know, being that we are um, voyaging Ohana, me being part of not only Hokulea, but also Makali'i um, and Kanehunamoku Ma. Um, what what you as crew members of Hokulea did uh, to bring us all together as Ohana Va'a. Um, and, and then not only as, as Ohana Va'a, but this like larger island earth Ohana um, to me was almost unfathomable, right? Yeah. And, and yet like the cost, the cost, the, the effort, um, and, and, and this like really audacious goal to like, we're gonna go around the world and we're not gonna tell people how to malamahonua, but we're just, we're going to, we're going to travel around the world. We're going to bring our own message, but we're also gonna collect um, messages of, of sustainability, of resilience, of that adapt uh, adaptability, of in indigenous innovation. So at the, you know, upon reflection, I guess my question to you, my first question is, um, what lessons remain true? Like, what did you learn from that? And what lessons remain true? And, and what's relevant today? Like, the, what's the relevant application today? Yeah, that's a great question, um, Mahina. And I think there's, you know, so much of what um, our, our kupuna, and thank you for opening the way you did, um, especially with the acknowledgement of our, of our water. Um, all of us should be uh, in acknowledgement of our water at this time and um, praying for it. So thank you. And, you know, the, the part about um, Hokulea and I, I, before I go any farther, you, you know, the, the Worldwide Voyage, there were hundreds of people that participated in the Worldwide Voyage. And uh, some of them are on, on tonight. I see, I think that's Uncle Billy Richards on there tonight, um, as well as uh, Kamana Pine, who, um, who was part of our team. And you know, just to acknowledge all of the crew members who sacrificed their time and away from being away from their families, um, you know, this idea of the canoe is obviously not a new one. It is it is this thing that has brought us together for thousands of years. 
And the story that came from these canoes that took us over these large swaths of water resonate to this day. And so part of what we were trying to do on the voyage wasn't just for what we find now, right, in these immediate times with our phones and in social media, but it was to, it was to put forth a message that would resonate now in today's terms, but also be a story that would resonate out much farther than our own lifetimes about what this small group of people did uh, at a time that was is becoming the uh, turning point. Hasn't yet been decided, but it's certainly we're on the cusp of this turning point. And so I think that's like um, one of the most important things is that the values on the canoe can help to engage and help to illustrate what that turning point is meant to be and help to guide it. Mahalo for that. So I know I know I can go there with you and that's why I'm gonna just push a little bit. So when, when you speak of that, that um, this turning point, Kapukaki, Red Hill yeah. is major. It's a major situation. So walk, can you walk us through like how, how, does, how does the lessons of the canoe yeah. and, and the installation, how does that translate to a very real crisis that we are all yeah. learning from right now? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, um, for, for, uh, for those of you who are on this, on this Zoom, you know, I'll share something really personal with you this morning. Um, I went with a handful of practitioners down to the, the Red Hill well uh, to Pule for the water and uh, to bring forth Akua and all of the, the entities that can help us to find our way forward. And um, that too is something that's going to stick with me for a really long time um, with respect to seeking out what are all the things that we need in order to find our way. Right, and this, this, this idea of wayfinding being central to uh, humans. And, and certainly as we illustrate what we need to do to find our way today, um, we need to think about not only what we value now and what our kupuna may have taught us, but also what are we leaving for the next? That's something that we, we talk a lot about, but do our actions actually reflect that? And certainly we are at a cusp of, um, you know, not to understate it, like we're on the verge of disaster on this island with respect to our drinking water. And the choices we make right now are gonna set us on these different paths and these different destinations. But the, the way in which we find our way should always be towards um, the idea of this, this uh, seven generations and what, where are we going to be in seven generations, not just where are we going to be in January or February with respect to this. And some of those lessons, I think, are going to come um, at really high costs at this point, and that they're not just going to cost uh, Hawaiians, they're going to cost everyone who calls this place home. I totally appreciate that. And, and for me, it brings, it brings it back home to me as a fellow um, Ba'a um, practitioner, right? Um, and in our practice, um, we're out but for me and I, 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 for you as well, when we're in the deep ocean, we're in the Moana Uli, mm -hmm. um, everything makes sense. Mm -hmm. Everything makes sense. Um, and, and we're able to, I, for me personally, like I'm able to um, visit, I'm able to see the tangible and the intangible genius of our, of our, of our kupuna. I can see it in work, right? I can see it in, in metaphor and I can see it in its, in its, um, its scientific and its mechanical design as well. Um, and, you know, my first D, uh, long voyage changed me, forever changed me. And it gave me, for me, it gave me um, uh, this, this compass and a, and a context for which I was able to then apply in my work at Hey a Fish Pond and then in other places. Sure. So my, my, yeah, so basically my, my question is, um, I actually, it's a question, it's a comment, it's, it's that I, I love what you did with your piece in, in, in 
helping to create some kind of visceral experience like you're able to like we're so privileged we're part of a, of a privileged group that gets to train and earn our play earn a a small place to malama these canoes and to malama these loina kupuna and to take this knowledge forward um and yet not everybody gets to participate you know in in a in a short vo voyage or in a long voyage so I really appreciate what you did. Can you speak a little bit to um, the, the design of, of your installation and what you were trying to evoke out of that? Sure. sure. I, I mean, I think it's a um, it's it's a pretty simple concept. You know, the idea is that um, you know the 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 literally the hundreds of thousands of hours of effort that go into lashing the canoe, that going to refinishing the canoe, uh, going to dry dock like you would with any marine vessel time and time again, all of that is actually embedded mana into the canoe. And then over the thousands of miles that we've traveled and the places that we go to, it collects more mana. And, and you can feel it, it's tangible. It's not something that we, um, we make up or we say, oh, this thing has mana. It's like, the, like it reverberates from the canoe. And you can tell because when, when people come and they just, they just touch the canoe or they step on board the canoe, they can feel it. And and yet moving the canoe is such a uh, heavy burden. Uh, so, so sometimes uh, you can't bring a canoe to a small community um, because of weather or logistics. And, and really like that's part of our job, I think as filmmakers and being part of the voyage was to figure out ways to do the next best thing, which is bring the canoe to them through story and through video and through uh, these interactions in pairing with crew members who would go out as well. And so this, this installation was really to kind of flip the switch on what was possible with video, but not on a screen that you would watch, but like you saw in the, in the piece right before this, that you could actually interact with. And, and uh, the idea was that some of the plates that we, we included were life-size. So there were plates of the deck of the canoe that was basically the same, the same exact size as the canoe itself that you could step on board and to just provide a space and place for people to interact with. Um, even though the canoe wasn't physically there, we're, we're, at, we're indoors, we're up Malka, we're not near the water, but there were these elements that I think still translated into um, the, the look and feel to transport people. And that was really what, um, you know, we set out to do by by the design of the exhibit and then working with um, uh, Taylor folks, uh, Taylor and Marlene to to really bring to life. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, it did definitely did that for me. It brought me back straight straight away to um, some of my some of the tough experiences that I've I've uh, been a part of and and all the great stuff too and everything in between. So mahalo. I have one last question before we, we move to, um, we bring Jen on. So here's a question. Given everything, given our current context, given, and when I say current context, I mean um, kapukaki, mm -hmm. the climate crisis, the pandemic, um, and given the, this like, tremendous uh, worldwide, worldwide voyage, epic voyage. Um, what have we not yet learned in your opinion? Oh, we, we haven't um, learned that we're not in control. Mm. That's what we haven't learned yet, that, um, that we, can, we, can, we can spin it, we can pre pretend that we are, we can tell people that we are, uh, we can explain away the changes that are um, in front of us, uh, but we're, we're not in control. And uh, that may be a phenomena that um, we never learn or learn be, you know, later than, than uh, when it's too late, but that, that respect for uh, Akua, that respect for place, that respect for, um, uh, the elements that we 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 pro get life from, there's a reason why that respect that respect needs to persist is because it can be taken away, and and we're learning some of those lessons 
uh, right here, and we um, we may have more to learn. But I would also offer that we're extremely resilient. That the people that we come from uh, uh, endured many hardships that are documented. That that uh, we're the survivors. We're the we're the ones who who um, are left after I don't know how many pandemics that that we have in recorded history, and yet another one in front of us. And and that. Uh, we've we've figured it out, and so I, I haven't lost hope in us. I think that there's plenty of um, plenty of ways to figure it out. We just have to have the will, and we have to uh, have control over the resources to be able to make those decisions. Mahalo nui. Uh, mahalo yawe, you know. Okay, we'll come back to a um, you know um, all panelists conversation, but we'll bring Jen Jen on now. Aloha, Jen. So I get to introduce you. Jennifer Goya is a new media artist born and raised in Honolulu. Her work explores the concept of memories as they pulsate through lived and artificial experiences util utilizing film, web design, and audiovisual programming. She received her MFA in computer art from the School of Visual Arts in New York and her BA and video art from Hampshire College in Massachusetts. Jen, even though this is a, our first kind of interaction with one another, I got, I felt like, you know, when I got to um, experience all of your folks' art and I, I, you know, I, when I was actually, Taylor was the one who brought me through, I just stood and I just, I just stood for a long time at your installation. And it was like, had all kind of, thoughts and emotions and wonders and uses. Um, I was totally intrigued. And I, I, I can still recall your, your installation. And I, 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 it did something in me where like I, it's left unresolved. And I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of get to know you through this panel conversation. But I wanted to invite you to share um, your process why did you, how, how, the hows and the why you chose to um, construct this particular piece and, and what does it evoke for you? Uh, thanks everyone for being here um, and having this opportunity to share uh, about the how and the why. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. We may just need to, um, yeah, perfect. That looks really good. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I kind of I put together some some images from my my time creating Remember Ohia, this interactive installation, and I wanted to uh, start off with this image right here. So this image is. Um, um, taken from aerial footage taken by the Spatial Data Analysis Visualization Lab at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. And uh, this was the image that really spoke to me first because I began to conceptualize Remember Ohia. Um, I started researching uh, rapid Ohia death and um, learning the devastation that was occurring on Hawaii Island and how it was spreading to other islands. And this was an image that I kept coming back to because in this picture, uh, we see the reddish brown tops um, and that's ohia trees that are newly infected uh, with ROD. And then the grayish white ones are dead ohia trees. So this is an ohia uh, forest on Hawaii Island. And so for me at first glance, it appears to be this like really beautiful image. Uh, but as you look closer and you understand those changing of colors, it shouldn't be that way. And I saw those changing colors and I just felt really sad and it became very frightening. And I really wanted to figure out a way to, I wanted to talk to everyone about RO, you know, ROD, but also how can we help others learn about what's happening? And since it's, it was something for me, it made me start to 
think back about my relationship with Ohia Lehua and learning about the mythology and the stories growing up and uh, learning from my kapuna about those uh, sacred deities and the respect that you have for Ohia Lehua. Think about that fate that was that was very And significant because it just made me question my, that relationship and it just kind of just jump started it so um, I wanted to show this other slide where I was exploring how to figure out a way to um, engage people with this topic about ROD and I normally don't work with 3D so this is an image where I was playing around and exploring 3D modeling and I wanted to know if I could actually animate a tree growing and dying and so this started it off and once I was able to make this um, I wanted to is from Ohia trees, and um, I use these specific images to model installation. So, time, and this was in maybe in March. Um, 2020 when I was able to then make this animation and I start to then visualize the space that I wanted it to exist in, in this animated and visualized world. And then COVID hit. And so everyone was, you know, expected to shelter in place. And um, I was trapped at home, um, working from home, but then I also had my five-year-old who was just starting kindergarten. This is her first time in school. I had a two-year-old that was trying to potty train and my husband was considered a central worker. So I was kind of just left alone. So it was really stressful. Uh, but the one thing that I kept on thinking about was actually Lehua. And I was like, you know, I wanted to make this, you know, with the Ohia tree, but I needed to stop because there was a lot going on. And um, that helped me really think about uh, this relationship between Ohia and Lehua. So um, I kind of wanted to share this. So this is kind of another aerial footage. And it started off by wanting to have people interact from being at home and having uh, the ability to draw with their computers and create Lihua blossoms. And then that slowly then turned into site. Well, I'll play this while it's then interact. So as when you see, this is just me doing a screen recording where I wanted people to be able to connect with each other because you're isolated. Uh, there was so much going on. A lot of people were affected um, in ways that, um, you know, was, wasn't expected. So I wanted this thing where the drawing, uh, I wanted it to be more physical. So then I had it where I was exploring um, motion tracking and using the web camera because people were, you know, zooming into work and having meetings. And so out of that process, it became this companion piece. And of experience I wanted to create to bring awareness to ROD, to raise awareness about the mythology uh, and the cultural connections to Ohia Lehua. And um, I created this landscape image. And this was something for me that was really important to make sure that when the viewer was interacting with this installation, that they felt a sense of purpose. Um, and Sense of purpose. So I ended up prototyping four uh, four different floor sensors. Um, you can see here. Here are some examples. Um, I did different iterations of a custom software that controlled the playback of this animation, and um, I found myself working with technology to create an experience that simulated something that was real. So the physical installation of it was something. frames and that was something really critical because I, I wanted the viewer to imagine looking out onto this lava field and having that sense of power and that a self-awareness that their role can have a positive and also negative change if it was something that was not in, you know ill-informed Ill and so I wanted to, people to start thinking and questioning their relationship between the Ohia trees that they saw through this installation uh, between each other uh, and then also uh, this is something that I wanted them to then be able to share and also think of a, a future where if it does, you know, devastate and wipe out all the Ohia Lehua population, this would be something like an artifact to remember it by. And I don't want that to happen. And so I thought this would be a nice resource to show that you can engage uh, with nature 
um, in alternative ways. So that was something that was really important to me. Um, my hope was that the installation allowed people to really embrace nature, but also embrace technology equally and really promote the conservation efforts that are going into the research behind ROD. Um, I think recently they just found out it's like spread through hooved animals. So they're learning more about how it's spread. And to me, um, I think uh, this, hopefully this installation will allow people to connect with what's going on um, on our island. So I wanted to also just kind of share a few slides of just um, some resources because I really did some research into the, the fungus that was infecting Ohia. And so these were um, the UH Manoa, the Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources College, and the Ohia Legacy Initiative provided a lot of a wealth of information um, that I used to um, make decisions in the animation. And then here are some um, books that I read thinking about technology and nature, and then also Ohia Lehua Forests and its role in our ecosystem, but also culturally, uh, spiritually, and, um, and in our physical space. A little bit behind the scenes. Um, but the why that it was important, um, I wanna show this slide right here. I want this to be the only option for people to engage with Ohia Luhoa. I want that to be thrive and abundant. And I wanted this uh, installation to be kind of a placeholder for to allow people to have to explore and be curious about this, you know, sacred and important tree, but then have this be something that they can use to have dialogue and conversation. I think it's super intriguing and cool that you have brought, you know, you're you're playing with this idea of of technology, of nature, of spirituality, you know, all, you know, and it's, it's basically a confluence of of, of all, all these ideas. Why did you why was that important to you? I always thought back about my childhood and how my connection with the Ohia Luhua. We had, you know, I went to my MA in Uwanu and we had the, the famous, it's everyone's like the fourth grade, you get to go to Hawaii Island and you have the sleepover. And yeah. um, and there it was everything that was connected, what I was learning in school was a, I was able to connect with it there. And it just became so real and it left a life, lifelong impact on me. And I thought about my kapunas and I thought about my relationship and I just found it so devastating to know that uh, it, it wouldn't exist if this continues to spread. And I know a lot of with our tourists um, kind of mindset that in Hawaii, a lot of people are like intrigued by this and they want to explore. And so I wanted to make sure people are aware that um, it can be easily spread by people and once infected can die in a in matter of days. And so it's rapid. And um, I wanted things to slow down a bit. Um, that was also one of the reasons why I made sure that it was this like slow kind of movement. And I wanted it to be something that um, it wasn't like a video game and I wanted that interaction to be uh, fluid, but also uh, they start to be self-aware of what their role is in controlling this growth or death uh, of this, this tree. Um, and also connecting it to like during COVID, I keep thinking about because uh, the show was put on hold and I was thinking about Lehua and Ohia and I was reading reports about, you know, sightings of, you know, marine life coming back to life. It was clearer in the ocean because, you know, there weren't tour or people on the beaches wearing sunscreens and coral was coming back to life. And for me thinking about climate change, I was like, there is a solution. We just maybe need to stay back. And I thought it was more important to have this piece done this way to show that there's other ways to interact and engage uh, with nature. Um, so I think that about that a lot. And um, I didn't think about it before when I first came up with it, but during the making of it, it became more apparent that this other uh, ways to interact with nature was needed. I mean, I love it, right? Um, I'm, I'm an educator. I, I spent a lot of years um, thinking about how to apply technology um, to play space learning and place-based education. So I think you've taken this like far beyond what I could ever imagine. I guess my question is to you, like for all of the, maybe the, you know, um, the, the creators, the future creators, the future programmers, the future developers, um, what advice might you have for them? I, are, are you hoping that this might be just one example that maybe some, some um, next gen 
uh, students and and so forth they get excited about and maybe where do you hope to that this will be taken taken from here and what advice do you have for them yeah question one I, I want people to be excited about interacting and trying to figure out like how do how do you get this to work so on one level I want it to people to embrace it conceptually learn about ROG, learn about Ohialehua and its significance to Hawaii. But then I also wanted them to, to physically be like, how, how is this working? There's sensors on the floor, there's a screen and thinking about coding. And a lot of the times people think about coding, you're like, oh, you, you have a great job, you can make a lot of money. Uh, but I never approached it that way. And my uh, my interest in learning it was always to tell stories and how can we use this technology to really um, get people to start talking about things that I find meaningful to share stories about my home and my family here. And um, my advice to students, um, and I tell my students, my own students who are interested, but you know, not sure um, how to go about it is that you, they have to find that story that they want to tell and think of possibly using these technology and these tools uh, to tell in a way that hasn't been done before. So that then one, it allows people to experience your message, but then also um, connect with it in a new way. And hopefully then that leaves a more lasting impact on them to uh, make it a change. Um, and also I, I really want it to be um, an example for people to know that, you know, with coding, um, once you have that story that you want to tell, it makes it easier to learn. So for me, there's a lot of things in this project that I had to figure out, like two thirds of the time was figuring out how to create a software that controlled this animation, you know, and coming up with these prototypes of these floor sensors. And I had to make it very custom because I wanted that experience to be too, you know, through these frame um, TV monitors. And that process was something that I learned. Um, so it was a lot of moving parts and in the end, I think it all kind of came together. And I hope everyone was able to kind of experience that as well as what I experienced. So it was the message, the concept of Ohialehu and connecting with that, but also, hey, I'm using technology to do that. And what does that mean? And so hopefully it started raising questions on um, maybe hopefully promoting people to want to learn about uh, interactive programming um, and how they can use that to tell their stories. I think you're brilliant. I think it's awesome that you are um, forging new new ground, new territory in, in this field. Cause you know, I, I, I don't know too many Wahine coders and I don't know too many Wahine coders um, and, and, and art makers. So I think it's, I think it's gonna be um, super fun to see what you're able to do in, in you know, in, in the future and, and probably you're probably raising this whole, you know, um, next crop of, of students, um, whether they're seasoned, uh, mature students or, or younger. I, I think um, we need more Jennifers <laughs> in Hawaii. I want that too, because I never really had a lot of them are, are Kane Mel coders. And a lot of the times it's kind of like black and white. And uh, how I think and talk about code is a little bit different than some of the people that I know that like to code. So I want more uh, Wahine to just want to be interested in coding and it's really easy. So, Mahalo Nui Jen. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work. Um, so, yeah, as we bring on uh, our next panelist, just wanted to just highlight some of the things that I've heard that have been um, brilliant already uh, from Not Lehu. Um, one quote that I, I appreciated that really caught my ear is, we are not in control. And, and this other um, thought that Jen just offered up, uh, focus on the story you want to tell um, and utilize technology to spark curiosity and, and deeper questioning. So mahalo you folks. Okay, now we get to have a conversation with Kapulani. I'm a little scared and I'm, and I'm super excited because I have so much um, uh, admiration for your work. Truly, I do. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about yourself via your bio. Kapulani Langraf was born and raised in Pu'ahu'ula Kane'ohe. She participated in the ninth annual Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art at the Queensland Art Gallery of Modern Art. Her books, Navahi Panako'ala Poko, which I love, thank you so much. This is a beautiful reference. And Nawahi Kapu'o Maui, 
received Kapalapala Pookela Awards for Excellence in Illustrated Books in 1995 and 2004, respectively. She published A Luku Vale with Mark Hamasaki in 2015. My kumu, my English kumu. <laughs> uh, Kapulani received a 2013 Visual Arts Fellowship from the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation and the 2014 Joan Mitchell Painters and Sculptors Grant. Kapulani is an Associate Professor of Art at Kapi'olani Community College, but is currently a Title III Project Director. I see you as this um, renowned, renowned photographer that has uh, captured um, just really just like the rawness of of, of each time and wahipana and wahikapu and um, and the spirit of, of that place. Um, the, the spirit that endures over time and over the, the generations and also the, the, the magnitude of perhaps whatever issue or 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 topic or story that you're you're helping to convey and express. I just really appreciate your work, Kapulani. I love it. Every time I, I look at any of your work and I, I'm, um, I'm always impacted. So thank you for uh, just the, the person that you are being a, um, a, a mentor for many or a role model, an exemplar uh, for many. So mahalo nui. Mahalo okay. Are you not gonna remember when we first met? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't remember, I remember. It was in expirations. You're in my dorm. Yes, I do remember. <laughs> That's right. And you remember because I was the I was the the Maikai one. Of course. Of course. I do remember. Now that you say. Okay, okay, okay. Um, were we going to um share any of, of Kapulani's? Thank you. Some of your visuals before we go into questions. Kupuna were arrested on the Mauna Kea Access Road for blocking the construction vehicles from going up to build TMT and in documenting um, Hawaiian struggle for a long time. Um, I was really moved by what happened, that I've never seen that before in photographing it. And I know there was a lot of tension that day, a lot of unknowns, but what you really saw was a, a group of people who just came together in Aloha and really care for one another. It was something that I never ex experienced in all the times I've worked on. So these are the 39 kupuna who were arrested on uh, July 2019 and down below are the names of Aloha Aina warriors who fought on uh, January 6, 1895 to uh, restore Queen Liliuokalani back to her throne. So the background is the different oli or protocols that were taught on Mauna Kea. And I never saw that before where everyone came and if, if you went to the Mauna you saw the protocol happening, how everyone learned it. So I did make these uh, ribbons and it says Maipoina Oya'u, sort of copying what Lili Wakalani did when she was in prison, that she made these ribbons that we cannot forget. So I think the importance for all our leaders in the Hawaiian community is not to forget them, not just have their names, but we remember their images, what they really stood for and how much of a, a risk they took for us. As a artist that's been around for a while and experienced the artists of what you before. I was really blown away by the amount of issues because a lot of the issues are not covered in contemporary Hawaii art. So I'm really excited to see what's what's really there after it's up. Whew. Yep, July 17. July 17, I will never forget that day, 39 kupuna. <sighs> so when you, when you took these um, pictures of these 39 kupuna, what do you see in their eyes? 
what are they telling you? What do you see? Now, so so um, I think about half of them, I took them right before they went to their first, first uh, court appearance. And it was taken right before. Um, and, and you saw, I, I know they didn't know what to expect, right? And I think we were really surprised of what ha happened. Not, not that they got um, let go, but that um, they continued with this process that, you know, is so heavy. Um, so, you know, it was really fast. It was taken right before, and I had help from Noi Noi and Antipo Case for bringing them to me. I don't know if they knew what we were doing, um, but it was really the importance that, you know, um, in going back to those uh, Ko Aloha Aina of 1895 and, and really not knowing who these people are. Sure, we know like who the leaders were, like Robert Wilcox and um, Navahi, but we don't know these other people. And I think, so I wasn't there on the day they were arrested. I was there on the first day where there was so much tension um, and really not knowing what was gonna happen. And like, you know, I've been going through these things for a while. Um, I never experienced what happened there. And it was just that first day. Um, people taking care of people, you know, um, and just really willing to sacrifice, right? Those guys who were attached to the cattle guard. Would you do that? I mean, and, and so I think it's really about really remembering the people that stood up. Um, and, and not just, you know, looking at the people that were the kupuna that arrested at Mauna Kea, but also looking at our past. Um, and, and the ribbons, I really wanted to do a takeaway in some way of getting some sort of funding to the kupuna for their court cases and stuff like that, but I couldn't because of where the museum is located. But um, so I got the idea about the ribbons. And when I started doing that, Honani K Tras passed away. Um, so if you look at the ribbon, there's an HKT on it. And it was like HKT. HKT. So um, it was really difficult. I think if you know Honani and, and if you were around at the time, everyone started talking about her on social media. And but what about now? Do do we remember the, you know, and she did it alone. And I don't know if people know how much she um, did for our people. I mean, sure, we see it now and, and you know, past, but what about then? And so it's, it's thinking about how we remember Honani K, how we remember all these other people who have passed away, who really took that lead um, in a time where it was, it was a lot worse than now. Um, so that's basically it. And I'm a photographer, so I, I like images. I like looking at historical images and can't find them if you go back. Um, so that's kind of what it was about. No, it's a gift. It's a gift for, for the future generations, right? Um, that you had the, the foresight um, and, and the ability to be able to, to do this. Um, because you're right, 100, 200, 300, 1,000 years from now, um, Hope, hopefully these these photographs will be cared for yeah these and the names will be cared for um and so perhaps it's going to be you know somewhat like um uh the, the same of uh, a similar effect that the kuya petitions have for us you know generations down the line they'll they'll see kupuna that um took a stand for a sacred mona and and they'll remember uh, a story, and they'll remember uh, the the ongoing kuleana. Mahalo nui for that. Um, you know, I, I didn't plan for this question, but who are some of these other kupuna, or who are, yeah, who are some of these other kupuna or or leaders or heroes, uh, whether well known or or not, um, that you know, if if you had an opportunity to to take a picture of um, so that it's part of this, you know, body of, of, of information that can be passed on. Who would that be? Too many oh, to list. Oh yeah. Right. Could you list a couple? Oh, <laughs> putting me on the spot. No, I mean, there's, there's a lot, right? I mean, and, and there are pictures of Honda in the case, so not, not in saying that, but also remembering, I'm giving something away because I'm working on a new project, but um, it's remembering what they said to, right? those really important things that were so are so important for us that we need to look at that and not to forget that. Um, but 
Yeah, I mean, it's even going back to our Aliki and, and before that and what they stood for. Um, yeah. Mahalo for that. And and also some of uh, the other kia'i too, right? There were, like like you said in, in your opening and also in the, in the video segment, there were so many folks that were part of of this stand, right? The stand for um, for Mauna Kea in, in 2019 and in 2015 and all the, the decades before that, um, you know, Pu'uhuluhulu Univers Pu University and the entire Pu'uhonua, right? There's so many um, actors in this that really help to, to keep everyone together um, to, provide, to create a sense of community. So that would be awesome too. Yeah, so, so I think when I did it, I really wanted to, I was going to do like postcards, you know, like almost like trading cards, where I was going to have all the other key, you know, all the guys, you know, right. Um, but then uh, I think it makes more of an impact. It's just the kupuna, the kupuna that got arrested. No one else got arrested. And even if you look at the text underneath the images, there are um, people who were arrested for Mauna Kea. Like I didn't want to forget them. So their names are there. Um, but I think that was the turning point of this whole Mauna Kea thing, was the arrest of those kupuna. So I really wanted to bring it to that. And, and, and why? Why are we arresting kupuna? Yeah. yeah. So why, why bring Mauna Kea into the Honolulu, Honolulu Museum of Art? Why not? <laughs> What? Why not? Oh, Why not? I mean, no, so, I mean, so, like, oh, the patrons and the, oh, you know, it's kind of uncomfortable. So I don't know. Speak to us about that. I, I, I didn't think that was uncomfortable. I did a, a work previously in 2019 called Out uh, where I thought I would get huge criticism, but I didn't. So, you know, I think the art world out there is changing. I think by having this artist of Hawaii and having really issue focused work, is a change. Um, it's about time. <laughs> okay. Yep, agreed. And we have we have allies and and male um, kako like Taylor and Jana and Christine and and their colleagues. Um, here's another one for you. So, hundred years from now, what will be remembered about the Mauna Kea movement? What do you what do you uh, project or hope hope for? Um, I don't see the Mauna Kea movement stopping. So I just hope, you know, it did stop because of the pandemic, but I just hope that, you know, it, it, it was anyone who went there, you know what an impact it was. I mean, like you had to be there, right? I had to, I wanted to, I wanted to take people there, right? To really experience that, something that you never experienced before. So I only am hopeful um, where maybe I wasn't hopeful before that that you, you saw it was, you know, certain people are always fighting these issues, but this became, right, worldwide. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you're, you um, maintain um, a sense of hope, you know, because you, you've, you have sat down with a lot of our, you know, frontline Kanaka who have been fighting the fight. And, and to hear you say, that um, even, even in the depth of, uh, you know, uh, experienced trauma, uh, that we, we, will, we will maintain hope that we are seeing change, signals of change, and that um, collectively, collectively, um, we can, we can all, uh, we can continue to, to strive and to thrive. So mahalo for that. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, I wanna bring everybody back on and we're gonna have, thank you for staying on for a little bit longer than um, maybe you had planned for, but we're gonna stay on for 10 more minutes if you don't mind. Um, Kapulani, while our, our other folks um, join us, do you have any, for, for those um, social justice artists that are really just trying to hone their craft, particularly those who are maybe, and, and, and maybe this is, we'll start off with a couple of any, but all of you um, as filmmakers, as, um, as uh, digital makers, what, how do you define your art, Jen? Define digital art, new digital art. art. Okay, that's yeah. what I thought, but I didn't want to mislabel. Thank you. Oh, thank you, yeah. But Kapulani, what, what advice do you have 
for um, for those who are trying to hone their 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 social justice craft. Um, need to be fearless and not worry about what anyone else is going to say. Um, really have you be on a really strong uh, foundation and know what you're do your homework and that's all that's important. No need to please anyone else but yourself. Oh, oh yeah, mahalo. How about you, Naalehu? Advice? The Pilina um, is important because it provides you the kind of access when there's all of that tension and, and you bring a, a camera into the space. Uh, when people know you, they, they allow you in. And that's where some of these amazing images get made is that access. And you, Jen. Freeze as possible and share, 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 and um, talk about yourself and how you connect so that other people can then be inspired to want to learn. Um, but I want to like couple you mentioned about like the question about being uh, in the something like hopefully it's not too something that made people feel uncomfortable. People, I think that's the best time when they feel a little bit uncomfortable because that's when they start to question their biases and you know their backgrounds. And I think that's when people start to then become really self-aware. It's like, why is this making me feel uncomfortable or, you know, unsure? So um, I'm like, yeah, why not? Like it should, if it does, I, I think that art should embrace that opportunity for people to um, really feel at, maybe at ease and also at not at ease um, with the images and the stories that they're they're taking in so that they can make informed decisions about what, what they're processing. So I, I really like that, that you said that. Hallelujah. Okay, we have a question. Um, Teodoro, I think that's how I say your name. Mahalo for your question. So as an artist, how can I get involved in contributing, sharing, and offering my skills to the arts movement? I'm originally from Silicon Valley, now living in Chinatown, the artist lost. Um, I do code my websites. I would like to get involved. This person wants to know how um, to get involved. Figuring it out, and I, I think it's just to be a part of this group show. I don't think I would. Uh, I feel privileged to be a part of the show that has all these really powerful messages and topics that are really close to home. We see it out there in our in our communities, and um, being around artists who have these stories to share. And I think having the opportunity to exhibit in this show and just be open calls and meeting other artists and hearing what they're working on um just to continue to make art and try to share it and if you make websites put it up online it doesn't matter if you have you know a facility to share it i think that's something that can be really useful mahalo nui and looks now we looks looks like we have an, uh, another comment in the chat One of the artists that was a part of the Hui was Roland Casimiro. Interesting, during our journey, he was working on the music and lyrics of what became known as the Saga of Hokulea. Wow, super cool. Well, folks who are listening in, we have time for maybe two more questions, but I'm gonna throw a, a one more question to the Hui of you. So, you know, um, artists of Hawaii now is gonna start to wrap up, yeah? Pretty soon the... Um, the exhibition will close. So what's talk to me about what surprises or richer meaning um, has has spurred for you, has spurred for you? Go ahead, Lahu. I'll take a swing at it, um, Mahina. I mean, I think I think certainly um, I've always considered myself a filmmaker, um, but maybe not not so much an artist. And so even uh, in conversation with Taylor to ask me to apply, it's kind of like needed to be coaxed into it because I said, oh, I'm not an artist, you know, and, and going through this process re really kind of helped me to realize um, the artist elements that are that are in the craft of the, the kind of filmmaking that I do. And then also just um, just a simple thing, like, like the, the images are not that different than what you would put up on a screen in a theater or, or play back like we did tonight. But the orientation and then allowing access for people changed the whole dynamic of how people could engage. And 
so just something that simple, I think, um, is a real important lesson in in terms of uh, what what not to not to miss uh, when you're can it just be simple stuff that'll just totally change how people can relate to what you're doing. Mahalo for that uh, access. Yeah, access super important. Anyone else want to respond to that question? What surprises um, come up for you, or um, deeper meanings or richer meanings came out of you know your experience with um, artists of what you know? Go ahead, Jen. Like I was talking too much. Um, well, well, this for me, it was like appreciating where we live and this time and now, like artists going now, what's going on and be able to connect, you know, with what's most important, what are our values and maybe taking a break and reassessing, like maybe there's other things that need our support and learning about the Kapuna that were arrested, like, how is that like that should that should disturb people that they felt that they had to arrest these people that are kapuna and I, I uh, for me it's just like I don't know I guess my free flow thinking of uh, just like that to me is just to be able to connect with other things that maybe you weren't familiar with or read about in the news but this is another way to connect with it in a deeper way. Yeah, I appreciate that willingness to become uncomfortable right and willingness to learn to participate and to and to like react yeah it's okay it's okay to react yeah. mahalo thank you kapulani thoughts about this question uh no but there's a cute there's a question and answer question in there i I'm saw sorry. that by noel so i'll read that out loud um so this is from uh, a fellow artist uh noel kahanu and historian uh do you feel like this exhibition is signaling a change in homa and its connection to the hawaiian community Absolutely. And thank you for the question. And, and it's been a long time coming and it's important to, uh, if this museum is going to be uh, open and uh, welcoming to all people, then it has to be a reflection of that. And so honored to be a part of this this year. Kapulani, thoughts? Um, my experience with HOMA has always been good, um, but you know, I definitely see a change. Um, happening and more open to Hawaii, but I but I do think it's also important that the community um, keeps them accountable to that too, um, so they don't forget who's out there and what's the you know the, the makeup of that community. Absolutely, um, Jen, did you want to respond to that as well? You good? Okay. So we're gonna um, close this, but I'm gonna do. I'm just, you know, I want to. I want to end on a, on a lighter note because um, we've we've gone through all different kinds of depths and colors and and hues and so forth. So we're gonna do a quick lightning round. So just answer very quick, whatever comes to you, um, like five seconds or less. Okay, just one to two word answers. Um, okay, and we're gonna go same order. We're going lehu. Jen and then Kapulani. Okay. Favorite Netflix series to binge on? Go. Lahu. Or Vudu. Oh, um, <laughs> I forget what it's called, but it's this those guys in uh with the with the uh orange. The thing in Oregon. I forget what they're called, but it's an yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I those forget the title, it's but I know it's mean. But that that one I that was the first binge worthy worthy thing on Netflix that I just could couldn't stop watching. Cool. Jen. But I've, I've been watching Hometown Cha Cha Cha. It's a K drama, and I normally don't watch K dramas, but now I can see why people get obsessed with them. So, Hometown Cha 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 is a fun one. Mahalo, Kapulani. No time to binge. My kai. Okay, <laughs> next question. Um, a lesser known Kanaka artist you are stoked for and want others to know about? Lahu. Oh, I don't know if this counts, but um, because he's he's pretty well known at this point. But Anna Paikai came up as like a young college student at at uh, OEV TV. It walked in my door with you know uh, didn't know which way it was up, and now he's uh, he's dominating the field with uh, somebody some now. Making yeah, so uh, keep an eye on him. It probably uh, 
probably win an Academy Award sooner or later. So keep an Shout eye out. Shout out to Aina. Yeah. My Kai. Jen. Artists that were in the show. To me, I, you know, was looking for a community to connect with and being a part of it made me feel connected in that way. So everyone in the show, I feel like, uh, shout out to them. Awesome. And you, Kapu, Kapulani? Um, artist and curator, Drew Kahuaino Broderick. Ooh, yeah. Yes, mahalo. Okay, here's the last one. One change you would have the legis uh, legislature make, make, <laughs> or enact? Oh, uh, defuel Red Hill. Mahalo, Jen. And home caregivers and caretakers in a way that they can um, live, live in Hawaii and not have to move away. Mahalo. Kapulani, you have the last word. Um, control over Hawaiian rights and aina and resources. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, mahalo to the, each of you um, for your genius. And mahalo for um, spending more time that, that, than perhaps you had expected. I appreciate each of you. Um, Lahu, love to you always. Kapulani, I always get a little nervous around your presence because I have so much respect and aloha for you. And Jen, it was so great to get to know you um, in this time. And I really look forward to hopefully our, our paths will cross again. Aloha nui. And I'm going to turn it over now to our fabulous, um, wonderful Taylor. Oh my gosh, mahalo piha to every, each and every one of you, um, and just, just like infinite gratitude to each of you for um, just like saying what needs to be said right now in this moment, and for being in this space, this digital space, and also for being in the show, and for, um, you know, as Kapilani was saying, being fearless and and putting your work out there, and um, and working with me and Marlene throughout this journey. Um, it's been just, an, just just this incredible privilege and honor, um, and huge thank you to Mahina for uh, really guiding us through today's talk and for being just like the epic creative and entrepreneur and mover and shaker that you are. Uh, and thank you to um, everyone who has um, been with us today, or who might be tuning in at a later date in time. Um, this was like the perfect amount of time and this the perfect conversation to have right now. And um, thank you to everybody. And I hope everyone has a beautiful rest of your day. And um, Aloha Nui. <laughs>